TNT has made an unparalleled commitment to Babylon 5, producing an original fifth season to complete the five-year story arc. Babylon 5, strong and getting stronger, exclusively on TNT. Whoever speaks for the Alliance speaks with one voice for many. Consequently, this contains the first page of every holy book of every race that has joined the new Alliance. Whoever speaks for the Alliance does so with the understanding that it is the inalienable right of every sentient being to live free, to pursue their dreams, to address wrongs within their own society without fear of retribution, to believe as their conscience requires in matters of faith, but also to respect the rights of others to believe differently or not at all. You want to be president? Yes. Put your hand on the book and say, I do. I do. Fine, done. Let's eat. On the next Babylon 5, a new captain. Welcome aboard. Good, I want to jump right in. A new president. I'm determined that nothing's going to go wrong with Sheridan's inauguration. A new problem. Somebody wanted him to be found here. The question is why. I'm here to make sure you pay the price for your actions. He knows our system inside and out. He's smart, he's deadly, and he's after you. I can't go along with postponing the ceremony. Will Sheridan's first day in office also be his last? On the next Babylon 5. You have transmissions holding. Badge incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. there in podcast land welcome to gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast a part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices we're a group of newbies watching babylon 5 for the very first time and a group of first ones who have watched babylon 5 far too many times and we're here today to enter the fifth and final season of babylon 5 with no compromises i'm scott and with me is blake nicole mike justin emily jesse and kevin before we get moving down this wonderful path that is season five, let's go ahead and remind everybody to check out all our social medias. All the links are down below. We're active on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Also, we do have our Patreon, where if you join that at any level, you can join our Discord, where folks have both a general discussion thread as well as a spoiler thread where you can chat to your delight about spoilers without the newbies checking it out. Uh, also, please be sure to leave a review. We still have a um, someone who decided that they don't really need to be an adult ever in their lives. Uh, the word uh, you're looking for is a wanker. Okay, that's true. That's true. Uh, that is uh, review bombing us every single week because, you know, I guess that's what you do when you have no penis. Uh, so if you can, be sure to go over to Apple specifically and give us a five-star review to offset this tool of a person who really, really needs to get laid. Hi, whoever you are, I'm done saying your name. But we did get a five-star review this week, and this comes from Winston Smythe. I don't know that I like this show. That's how he starts. I don't know that I like this show, but I enjoy it. I enjoy it so much that I'm even considering watching season five for the first time since the original airing. Well, if you decided to watch it since the original airing, you're probably listening to this now. So thanks for the five-star review, Winston. Go ahead and send me three more because I need to offset the tool bag. Thank you so much. We're going to go ahead and start talking about no compromises. So we're going to get a synopsis first, and that will come from Kevin. As the station adjusts to the arrival of a new command officer and prepares for Sheridan's inauguration, a group of telepaths arrives looking for sanctuary. And a good perm. Definitely a good perm. <laughs> Byron has a He does. He does have luscious locks. He does. 
And one of them looks like Leonardo DiCaprio's half brother. So yes, yeah, he's special. We call him special whatever. Special. Was Bob. that Simon? Oh, Simon. I, I thought we were watching Twilight. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought he reminded me of like Leonardo DiCaprio from What's Eating Gilbert Grape. That's what he reminded me of. <laughs> Again, like when, that young. We'll we'll young get Leo. there. But when he actually called out, we call him special. I'm like, oh, this is the '90s. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, we got away with a lot of shit back then. <laughs> Before we start talking about our telepaths and everything else that's going on, let's get our first impressions from our newbies who have watched this episode for the first time uh, for this review. And we will go over to Jesse first. Jesse, first impressions on No Compromises. I fucking hate you guys. Um, <laughs> I do not have another four seasons to enjoy a new commander. And <laughs> clearly, we knew that was coming and I predicted that my head was going to fucking explode and it did. And I hated every bit of it. And I just, you know, what? fuck this whole fucking thing. I don't, I don't even want to watch the rest of the season. <laughs> Jesse, we discussed mm. this way back in like season two, I think when we, uh, cause you, you had started saying that I really like Ivanova. It was maybe mm-hmm. into season one, early season two. And we said, well, that makes sense because Ivanova is much like Jesse. Okay, she has the same kind of personality. I said in that Beyond the Rim, and when you listen to it again, you'll you'll catch this. I said that actually, I think Lockley is more Jesse than Ivanova is. Buckle up. I don't have an entire four seasons to like this bitch, so she better become very much more like. <laughs> okay, she doesn't like anyone on the show either, so it's all good. 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 You Let's just hurry told Garibaldi up, though Sheridan to fuck off, so it was great. So yeah. Scott. We now need to get Tracy Scoogins booked on this show just for Jesse. Uh, right. I need to get her booked on the show just for me too, but that's a whole other reason. Wow. Private show. That's a private I've been a show. fan of her since yeah. um, Lewis and Clark. Lois yeah. and Clark, sorry. When she was, um, oh, what was she? Oh, she Kat was- Cat Grant. New- Thank you. She was the news anchor, Cat Grant. Yes. She's been in a lot of stuff. Yeah. She's got a lot of IMDb gr- credits. But we'll talk Lockley in a little bit, sure. And I'm sure Jesse's going to enjoy that conversation a lot. But Jesse, did you have any other impressions that you wanted to get out? I still haven't seen Monkey Man Bar Thunder. Mm. I'm starting to lose, lose faith. He'll be here for the series finale. It's actually the big reveal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Cheers. He's two in the bartending at the end of the final episode. Yes. And then he just walks to the back and it's seen. No, he walks <laughs> He walks to the Zocalo door and says, sorry, we're closed. The end. It's funny because when I go to my apps on the TV to go to the Tubi app, there's a some kind of ad for monkey. It's called Monkey Man. And I'm <laughs> every single time I see it, it's I'm like, spin off. Oh, yeah, no, this isn't it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The Frasier of the Babylon 5 world. There we go. <laughs> Frasier was arguably better than Cheers. I can't imagine a mm-hmm. Monkey Man shut your mouth, uh, show no. being better than Babylon 5. I but... 100% agree with Kevin. Frasier, mm-hmm. I've seen them both. Frasier is... That's in. six weeks in a row. Stop Dude, it. We're not going to start this shit. Yeah, Frasier is guys. So, much, so much more well-written than Cheers. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Dear Diary, okay. Scott and Kevin agree. Frasier was better because it had Niles. Oh, yeah, That's true. for sure. David Hype yeah. oh. is a huge part. He stole the whole damn show. Oh, yeah. It should have just been about him. So, so did, and that's and that's so why the John Mahoney season of Frasier. Yep. All five of those main cast members were just they're all perfect, phenomenal. Perfect. I assume Eddie the dog is one of those five. Like all six <laughs> all right. six yeah. of those characters were perfect. I have a Jack Russell now because of Eddie. So oh, nice. <laughs> oh, I had such a crush on Jane Leaves. It wasn't even funny. Well, that doesn't shock me anyway. So we'll get, we'll get Tracy Scogans and Jane Leaves on this show, and we'll be fine. Uh, and Claudia for Emily and Hey, uh, Roz wasn't oh bad either. No, not at all, but it must have been the English accent. I was more of a Roz fan myself, but it's okay. Yeah, I this like This podcast will look like a Jackson Pollock <laughs> painting by the time we're all done. It didn't already? It's too early for your shit. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Okay, let's keep on going. Nicole, first impressions. So this might be a hot take for some of the other newbies, but I actually liked the episode. There was a lot of uh, changes, which, of course, I'm not happy about. I'm I'm sad that Ivanova's gone. I don't know how I feel yet about Lockley. Obviously, she's no Ivanova, but hopefully she'll grow on me. I feel like this episode kind of gave you a little bit of everything. The Delenn and Sheridan moments were really sweet. I loved that in the beginning when they were having their little coffee. I was proven wrong about somebody in this episode. I kind of ate my words a little bit. Then, of course, there was Garibaldi's kind of 
establishing himself again. And uh, I really liked the dynamic between him and Lockley. I just thought overall, there was a lot that happened in this episode. Felt sad. You felt happy. You felt joy. You felt love. It was kind of a little bit of everything. So Justin. Like Nicole, I'm undecided, honestly, about this episode. I, too, am not sure what I think about Lockley, but, again, I think that's just about the change of the whole situation. I'm going to try to give her the benefit of the doubt, but I am not a. I can't promise 100% that I'll come around to like her as much as we all loved Ivanova. The telepath story was actually, and the people who've been listening to me, you know, listening to us the entire time may be kind of shocked to hear this, but... The telepath uh, plot line was actually more interesting to me than the political assassination plot line. I'm not 100% how I, how I feel about the political and military split between um, Sheridan and, and Lockley. We've seen in other shows how well you make the political decisions and I make the military decisions go, and typically it doesn't end up going well. So we'll see how that ends up tracking out. And... Um, I saw probably in this episode the best swearing in ceremony I've ever seen. <laughs> you want to be president? Yes. Hold your hold it here. Say I do. I do. Great. Let's go eat. Let's eat. That was the best. Honestly, <laughs> I, that is that that is the best inauguration I've ever seen in 30 years of following politics. It's so Jack Jakar too, isn't it? He's just like, I oh, fuck it. Yeah. I tried. I tried He's three done. times. But, uh, Reminds me of the marriage ceremony from Spaceballs. Well, I'm thinking, there's, I was just yeah, going to say, some marriage is done that way, too. Yeah. Yeah, it still holds up, too, because my my 13-year-old daughter doesn't usually watch these with me, but for some reason, she watched this one with me. She busted a gut when Shakar said that. <laughs> She's, I it, did, it too. Holds up I... The, it holds up with the Zoomers, kids. <laughs> so I'm not sure what to think about season five so far after seeing just one episode, but we'll see. Emily. I'm not really sure, honestly. Like, it wasn't the worst episode we've ever had. It wasn't the best. I have a suspicion she was not on Sheridan's side in the conflict, the war. Just the way she worded that, I was like, oh, okay, I think I know what side you're on. I could be wrong, but it kind of gave those vibes. I will say I did appreciate her being very clear with Sheridan about their roles and what the expectations are because... That is a hard situation to walk into since he's still on B5 and people are still likely to defer to him for a lot of shit. I don't know what the fuck was going on with his hair, but it was terrible. Like the weird, poofy, oh, it was a nightmare. And I still do not like him and Dylan together. It's weird and uncomfortable and I'm I'm over it. If it helps you at all, Bruce Boxliner really didn't want a goatee, but JMS said, you have to look older and the goatee does it. And Bruce is like... I guess. <laughs> I really don't want a goatee. And no, Jay- the goatee didn't bother me. And I'm assuming they were trying to make it look like he had bed head because they were still like getting ready in the morning. But it just seemed like weird and poofy. And I don't, I didn't, mm, no, no, thank you. And the Sheridan hate train just keeps chugging <laughs> along. Now, the person that was really happy about their new hairdo was Jerry Doyle because he's been trying to shave his head the entire show and finally JMS let him. Yeah, he looked a lot better. Let's go ahead and go over to our first ones who have watched the whole series. And Mike, first impressions. Yeah, I um, don't, uh, as as the rest of you first ones, don't recall uh, having very fond memories of season five. But I I will say that while a number of, uh, of elements of this episode came off, fairly laughable to me and we'll get into that uh overall i actually quite enjoyed it i liked kind of how it set the tone for here's where we go next here's how we we visit upon the challenges of a new alliance forming and the changing of the guard and everybody settling into new roles and what their conflicts will be it kind of surprised me by how much i i did end up enjoying this episode kevin i like this episode it it has some elements that I really like about it. I like Janet Greek's direction. Uh, I like how they unveil, you know, the Captain Lockley character. I like the conflict, particularly with Garibaldi. I like that she's a a strong uh, female character, but she is not a carbon copy by any means of Ivanova. It's hard not to compare the two as you as you go through a little bit, but I think they do a good enough job of setting her up and casting well with her character that it it really makes for uh about as good a transition as as you could have had even for people who 
uh, like Ivanova, I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to separate one from the other because I think Tracy Scoggins' acting is is very good. I'm hopeful that I will enjoy season five a little bit more than the last time that I, I saw it. I already enjoyed this one more than I remember, so I think that'll be the case. I really do. This will be a nice way to watch season five with all of you to, to talk about it and, and uh, really pick it apart. I think that'll be really joy enjoyable. Maybe not joyful, but enjoyable. Blake? For as much hate as we've given season five and joking around over the last four seasons, I, I did like this episode, and it, it's not as terrible as people make it out. It, it's like any show. It has its ups and downs throughout the season, but I do like this one. Um, one, I will say, season one, we didn't really touch on the title sequences, but season five is by far my favorite of the title sequences and the theme song version. Yeah, I love this version. Really? I'm, I'm, well, yeah. hold on. I'm, I'm definitely going to bring that up. That's one of my discussion points. So Okay. Yeah, okay. We'll, get, we'll, we'll get just, there. We'll get there. Yep. But as Kevin kind of touched on, the dynamic between Lockley and Garibaldi is actually one of my favorite things about this episode, but even throughout the season. And a little reason on why. So when they did the casting on that, uh, Scoogan's read for the role and they, they had Jerry Doyle in the casting with her. And apparently it went completely off the rails, much like this podcast is prone to do and resulted in the two of them hurling insults at each other with finally one of the retorts came back where Joyle, Jerry Doyle said, lick me. And Tracy just turned around and said, lick me twice and walked out of the room. So the dynamic of those two throughout the show, uh, I really enjoy it. And this does set that up. And then, yeah, Jakar with the whole swearing in piece of, yeah, just put your hand on the book, raise your hand, say I do, and let's get to the buffet. I, I love that. For me, yeah, I, I'm with Kevin on this. And I've said this since like our first episode. Stop I think. agreeing with Kevin. It's disturbing, damn well, it. Well, I agree with you too. So chill. I have not watched season five in a whole probably in 20 years. There are mm. some, there's, a, there's some good arcs in here. And there's some good episodes in here that I watch a lot, but I haven't like, I don't think I've watched no compromise in probably 10, 15 years because I just didn't think it was part of the arc that I care about. That being said, this episode reminds me a lot of a season one episode in a good way. There's an assassination plot. Uh, it kind of gets wrapped up pretty easily. There's no big arc moments. It's just kind of a good fun way to kind of figure stuff out. The other things I kind of like about this episode is you absolutely get a good impression of who Lockley is. I'm sorry, Jesse. And I love that there's a dichotomy that gets called out in this episode. Uh, remember, we saw Sheridan's first day as well. And Sheridan was more aloof. He was like, oh, I get to have a shower. I get to have oranges. And there's a bowl of oranges on his uh, counter in this episode. And uh, where Lockley just comes in is like, okay, where is everybody? Let's get the shit together. Okay, um, I get a call. I'm ready to go. I'm in my office already. She is very much by the book. She is not going to take any shit. She's not going to be the happy-go-lucky Sheridan. She's going to just run this ship the way she wants to run it. And to everyone else's point, she calls Sheridan on, on it right away. I'm not going to take your bullshit. I am going to run this show the way I want it. And if I don't get to run it that way, go find somebody else. And there's a, there's a lot in there that I think is going to drive a lot of good storytelling over the next year. And I still think Jesse's going to love her at the end. Uh, yeah, you guys have already had the Jakar stuff. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's, it's a good way to start a season. Now, this is the second lowest rated season premiere of the show. Uh, Midnight on the Firing Line actually rates a little lower, but everything mm. else. Uh, and I think Midnight rates lower too because there wasn't as many people voting back then. So it's I don't think it's really comparable. But yeah, so this one's not rated. Is that the season one premiere? It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So yeah, it's a, it's a good place to start, I think. And I'm looking forward to, like with Kevin, I'm looking forward to kind of taking this journey with you all because I ain't been on this journey in a while. And it, it wasn't pretty the last couple of times I've been on this journey. So we'll see. Kevin, what do you got? Blake's story about uh, about Scoggins um, being cast in this is a is a really good one. It came down to five finalists, and so you know, as Blake mentioned, they brought in Jerry Doyle to read the uh, the Garibaldi scenes with the actresses, and um, from what Jerry 
described he said that you know this was this was she was his pick for it he thought that her acting chops were the best that their interactions were the best and that she would get along with the cast very well and to hear her talk about it she said that she was really dying to be on the show she had heard really great things about how you know tight-knit and uh, easy to work with everyone was and how you know self-contained they were in that abandoned hot tub factory you know not anywhere close to a, a main studio lot um, so they could kind of do their own thing a little bit and so when they brought her in for this episode she worked a lot with janet greek the the director and janet greek had talked with jms a lot about what they wanted to see and they really wanted to make a splash with her and show the the audience who she was early on with her character and she brings a bit of conflict because you're just not quite sure what you're getting from uh captain lockley and a couple of things so it's um i i I really i really got to hand it to the decision makers on this i think it was done very well i actually love her response to garibaldi at the end whose side were you on i was on the side of earth yeah that's how civil wars work It's kind of rough. I love it. Justin. That's, I think, going to be an ongoing question for a lot of people, and it may be a question that we never get answered. But if I can take the liberty to kind of drop one of my questions for the episode early on here, is it just me or... So I'm I'm of two minds about this. Does... Is there some kind of past between Lockley and Sheridan as characters, or was it just awkward on-screen chemistry between the two actors? So that's one thing I'm not 100% sure of, because it just kind of seems like that they've known each other. Sheridan personally requested her to become the commander of Babylon 5, but it just... I don't know. To me, it just seems like that there may be some kind of history there that hasn't been revealed yet. And if it's not that, then maybe it's just awkward screen chemistry between the two actors. Because, I mean, Box Lightner and Scroggins both, I think, did pretty well in this episode. But it just may be something weird between them. I'm kind of curious what I, what anyone else thinks. Yeah, and real quick, because I we, we're going to go back to season one and get hammered by the fanboys. I think each of us call, has called Tracy's last name something else now. It's Scoggins. So, oh, it's not Scroggins. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I would like to Scrog her, but it's not Scroggins. <laughs> Ew, Scott. Ew. <laughs> oh, come on. When Justin does shit like that, right. everyone loves it. But when <laughs> I do it. <laughs> I didn't say I love it when Justin does it either. I just didn't like the word I... Scrog. That that grossed me out. Scrog. Scott, Scott, I for one loved it, and I hope you get to shish kebab or sometime. <laughs> Stop it. We're not. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Nicole, what do you got? Well, I was just going to say, I I wrote this down because Sheridan listed why he chose her. And he said she's good with diplomacy. She's not afraid to speak her mind and she's not afraid to fight when she needs to. So what I'm my take on that or gather what I gather, Justin, was like maybe he kind of knew her from serving or maybe heard about her or whatever. But he just kind of like knew her record or maybe looked up her record because he probably researched people to to put in this role right and and thought who would be good for it and he said you know it would it would be good to have you know someone from earth force here to kind of mend those fences and stuff but also like because of her track record he said that's the only reason why i chose you is because of your record you know and then she literally says something to him and he goes see you're not afraid to speak your mind that's what i took from it that he just based upon military record only that's why he chose her yeah and the think so okay Nicole, I see it as actually a direct callback to what we saw in, in the beginning last week. She's not a hothead. She's not going to go in there and start firing first. She's going to try to find the solution. And if that doesn't work, then she'll fire. And I think that's what he's looking for. And that's what he called out the other guy for, you know, during in the beginning, that this guy goes in firing first and he doesn't like it. So I think it's like, like, was she the best of the losing side, perhaps? We don't know if she was a losing side or not. Well, when he's said that in the explanation and her response when Garibaldi asked one of the things Sheridan done was did was do not fire unless they're engaging so -hmm. there were like earth ships who were like and we're gonna hang out but not actively engaged so I'm wondering if that's actually where she fell she was technically on the earth side but she wasn't going to initiate any hostile interactions I think you can assume that if she was too violently on one the other side, that he wouldn't. He wouldn't have picked her. her. So if we don't know where she came from, but 
if she was on the quote unquote Clark side, I, I would agree with you, Emily. I think she probably wasn't one of the people taking everybody out, but we'll see. Uh, I, one thing I wanted to get into since we started jumping in and talking about Lockley is I did want to talk about what happened. We've kind of alluded to it a lot, but so here's here's the two sides to the story. Now there's, as a Vorlon would say, there's always three sides to a story, but I got two for you. I got JMS's and I got Claudius. I will say that Claudia's story has stayed fairly the same. I, I was just reading a quote from her in 97. And I've read her autobiography from just a few years ago, and it's almost the same. So I think her story hasn't changed. JMS has kind of, you know, adjusted a bit, but not too much. So what it comes down to is when they made the transition from PTN to TNT, Warner Brothers continued to be the studio that oversaw the show. And that's been that way since The Gathering. And so Warner Brothers went out to all the cast and said that we need to renegotiate your contracts. We need to get you all online. According to JMS, Claudia held out for two reasons. One, she wanted residuals and she wanted a raise. And according to JMS, Warner Brothers was not going to give residuals like she wanted. It was not going to give a raise like she wanted. And so he felt that she waited and waited, hoping to have that waiting be one of those where Warner Brothers is finally going to say, well, we need her on the show, so we'll give her what she wants. And that didn't happen. Warner Brothers said, okay, we're out. We'll just move on. They weren't happy about it. In fact, they, they went to JMS and said, you promised us we were gonna get the whole cast back. So why didn't we get the whole cast back? So it didn't go well for JMS either when she left. So what Claudia says is, yeah, she definitely wanted you know, a race like everyone else does all the time. But her key fact is that she was really trying to diversify her career. And so she was doing movies more, she was doing other shows more. And what she had asked for was 18 episodes out of 22. So she wanted a reduced contract, probably with more money, not going to lie, but she wanted a reduced contract. And what she was told is Warner Brothers said, you're 22 episodes. And if you have to do 22 episodes, you're going to do 22 episodes. And so finally, what happened, according to her, is she received an ultimatum, but it didn't come from anybody at the studio. It came from Jeff Conway who are, they're very good friends. And Jeff Conway said, look, I've been told that if you don't have your agent sign this by Friday, you're done. She was off in Europe doing stuff. And if you read her autobiography, it wasn't a good time for her either. And you can read into it as you want. But she called her agent after she talked to Jeff Conway and it was already Friday and the agent was already gone for the week. So mm -hmm. on Monday, the agent comes in and he receives a, fa he has a fax waiting for him. Yay, the 90s, it was a fax that says the contract is rescinded. The contract offer is rescinded. And so that was it. So JMS believes she was holding out on purpose. Claudia says that she was never contacted by the studio about a deadline until it was too late. And that's where we are. So that's take that as you will. I bet you it's probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, but that's that's why where we are, we are. And the reason why she was in, in the beginning is because this contract dispute finished up after that was filmed. Anything else we want to talk about with Lockie or Lock Lockie? Lockley or Ivanova before we move on to something else? Anybody? This wedding is Horseshit. <laughs> she did say even back in the 90s that she would love to come back and do other B5 stuff. And it took her about 20 some odd years, but she did. And we will get to that movie uh, as a cartoon later on in this run. Hmm. Let's go ahead and dive in to the rest of the episode. So let's uh, let's talk about this assassination plot. This uh, this D bag who wants to be John Wilkes Booth to our Lincoln. Or, well, not to Emily's Lincoln. He's definitely not Emily's Lincoln, but he's some people's Lincolns. What do we got? Nicole? Well, when he was giving the history dissertation on the voice messages, I thought of Justin. I'm like, Justin is probably popping a history boner right now listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I already knew all of it. I, you, you knew about the guy 50 years prior who <laughs> in the Eastern Bloc or whatever it was? Yeah, him and I, him and I went to elementary school together. It's fine. <laughs> I just that made me laugh because I was just like, this guy's giving a fucking history lesson. Like, shut the fuck up. Like, but it made me think of Justin. Um, but yeah, from the minute he came on screen, I was like, I hate this motherfucker. Like, I kept calling him stupid killer guy. And even at the end, when they said his name, I'm like, he's still going to be super stupid killer guy forever to me. Um, wow. Talk about bitter. He had an axe to grind with Sheridan and it was insane. Insane, like what he was willing the lengths he was willing to go to and clearly he didn't care about himself he was one of those i have nothing to lose kind of people it was like the reverse marcus like i don't care i have nothing 
but I'm a dick. Unlike Marcus, who was a, I don't care. I have nothing. I'm a, but I'm a soul, gentle soul. And I love people. There's you know no what I mean? t-shirt for you, Justin. I have nothing, but I'm a dick. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> like, it just, he, I fucking hated him. I hated him more than Morden. And I hated Morden probably oh, the most shit. on this. <laughs> yeah. And that's saying a lot. So, but I'll let somebody else talk. Like savage. I'm a fan of the, James Bond movies and watching this one kind of has me thinking of a quote from Tomorrow Never Dies was when they're looking at the Russian arms market and just goes, Christ, can't your people keep anything locked up? (laughs) You know, the fact that we've got an assassination plot that involves not one non-station personnel, but two non-station personnel able to just waltz in and get Star Furies. It's like, how can't they keep anything locked up on that? That's what Garibaldi was calling out. He's like, what the fuck? (laughs) Yeah. Although he couldn't get a space suit, so he even he even comments, yeah, if this doesn't go well, I'm screwed. And that's how Jerry Doyle left the show. I mean, I'm glad they wah, put that wah, detail wah, in wah. because he made it from the, the ceremony to the Star Fury Bay in record time. Yes. <laughs> Justin, what do you got? I'm sorry. This has to be the worst political assassin in history to me. <laughs> so what? this guy, this guy is like a camp commandant on some kind of concentration camp. And says, oh, my side lost. I hate you, Sheridan. I'm going to come kill you now. And again, like we talked about like a lot of different failures within Babylon 5 security. But this guy not only gets very close once, he gets very close twice. And why he wasn't flagged from the beginning to not be able to be even on the station is beyond me. But honestly, it's it's the worst reasoning for me. Oh, I was just some backwater prison commandant guy, and my side lost the war, so now I hate you, and I'm going to come and kill you, and I know a lot about Earth history, Mm. and speaking about Earth history, Sheridan's walking around like fucking McKinley, (laughs) and oh, I have to be in front of the people, and everything like that, and we know how that worked out for McKinley. Well, there's a reason so, why presidents are in, are not in uncovered cars anymore, like JFK. So right, yeah. like like JFK, and why you know you can't just go up and do a long handshake session with presidents anymore, like you did with McKinley, because last time that happened, dude got shot. So that's where I think that I I, I understand where Sheridan's wanting to come from with. I want to be a man of the people and I want to I want to eat where the people eat and everything like that. But it's just not going to work out. And I really hope he comes (laughs) to understand that, especially after this episode where people are trying to put him in. Okay, dude's not supposed to die for 20 years. Right. So he, he needs to worry about making that last as long as possible. I don't know. Okay, okay. I got a couple things. One, when you said he's going to eat where the people eat, I just got a vision of Sheridan going to Olive Garden. I just I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, I, don't I'm know. Gonna, I mean, that's what's going to happen. He's going to go to the fucking Buffalo Wild Wings of Babylon 5 <laughs> and just hang out there and eat shitty wings and drink beer and watch whatever sports still exist in the 23rd century. But I also I got two more things for you, Justin, because you made some really good points and I want to kind of counterbalance them here. So one, you're talking about how uh, historically and this guy obviously likes his history, although he calls out FDR and FDR wasn't assassinated. He was I mean, he was shot, but he wasn't shot at, but he wasn't assassinated. Yeah, He died. He died. the mayor. Natural causes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the mayor of Chicago who died for him. Yeah, true. But uh what I actually like about this and what I read this as, as this guy knows exactly what he's doing. And I, I called mm-hmm. him out as John Wilkes Booth. And that's what I think he's trying to do. He understands that his side is done. He even says, whatever happens after this, I don't care as long as you're dead. So he understands that this isn't going to change the tide of anything and usually hardly ever does. But he just feels like for his side, he has to step up. And so you're talking about a common well, any, from any- nowhere. And he wants to be a martyr. Yeah, that's well, the whole and that's thing. why you're yeah. talking about. Well, this guy comes from nothing. John Wilkes Booth was an actor, now a pretty prominent actor, but he was an actor. It's well, he was actually. I mean, honestly, though, Booth is different because Booth at that time was almost like if George Clooney tried to assassinate the to president an extent, of the United States. But yeah, I yeah, and I and I've heard that before, and I completely get contextually, but it's not because we don't have we didn't have a national 
media back then. It's a little different. But the whole point is, because of who he was, he could sneak into the room. But right. what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, it, I think he understands what he's doing here. This is not trying to take out the Alliance. This is not trying to bring back what Clark had. This is just, my side lost, I'm pissy, and I want to finish it off. But the, uh, the yeah. other thing, real quick, I wanted to throw at you too, and now I may have forgotten it which is great because it was the last thing you said. Ooh, this is Scott from the future while he's editing the podcast, which actually means it's Scott from your past, whatever. The other point I was going to make was the idea that Sheridan only has 20 years to live and he should figure out how he's going to use that time is kind of a plot point for the new Star Trek series, Strange New Worlds as well. So my point is, without spoiling anything, if you're not watching Strange New Worlds, you should be. Back to the past. Ooh. So, Nicole, what do you got? I was also pissed that he, like, took out a bunch of other people, too. Like, that sweet alien with the ball. I didn't catch your name when Delin said it. The game ambassador. Oh, the yeah. ambassador? She was so yeah. nice. And then he just fucking killed her and took her stuff. And then he killed that sweet boy. Like, what a fuck. I hate this guy. Like, he just, what really made me mad, like, Scott, you kind of said he's he doesn't care what happens as long as Sheridan's dead. So he's just like, anybody is collateral damage to him. Like, he's going to do what he's going to do to get his goal reached. And he's taking out all these innocent people have nothing to do with it in the meantime that just really pissed me off but mm -hmm. he also made a good point as the whole lone gunman statement that he made clearly he was able to get on and under the radar and kind of blend in and get a disguise and you know like it it was definitely uh easy for him and, and it, he had a point when he said that so as much as i hate him he was very good at what he was doing i want to know how that inside that game outfit smelled just, probably not good. I'm just thinking it's just probably not good. Although this is the first time we get to see what is underneath that helmet. Yeah. And, they, and I think the effects mm -hmm. are pretty good on that that mask. So Was that the first time we saw them without their helmets on? I don't remember seeing the game. Pretty aside sure. From, yeah. yeah we, we've always seen them in that okay. mask. And part of it I probably okay. was they didn't have the budget for the makeup. So <laughs> you wear the helmet. No, you're probably right. But I, I couldn't remember because... Like, it didn't really shock me, but at the same time, it's like, I don't remember if I've ever seen them without their helmets on. Okay. Yeah, which I actually thought was a, a, a clever part of his assassination plot, you know, because they're clearly in that situation. There are aliens who have to wear suits that keep themselves concealed. So it was pretty smart to, to kind of beefy swap card to, to conceal his identity uh, and get close. I thought that was, that was a nice touch. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about uh, the other side of that assassination, which is Sheridan and his work to become from president-elect to president. What do y'all want to talk about with that? I have a quick question. Was the usage of Sergeant Slaughter, was that a call out to the, the wrestling fans to try and, to try and interest them in something? The first, and G.I. Joe? Well, no, but Kevin's making a good point. The whole point yeah. of this entire exercise is to get more people watching wrestling on TNT. So... Oh... <laughs> That's, Cause, cause you're when, right. when he says Sergeant Slaughter, I'm like, and then he says it again yeah. so, to to underscore the point more. And I'm like, that man, that's got to be a call out to but was that? Fans. But that feels like it's too late for me. Well, if JMS is <laughs> kind of, you know, not a spring chicken. He's going to go with the references he knows. Right. But yeah, yeah no, this is le legitimately, I mean, TNT was trying to diversify their audience, bring more people in. And the death of B5 as a franchise, at least in the 90s, will be due to wrestling. So, I mean... Foreshadowing? I was going to say, I mean, I do think at that point in time, I think that... I think that flavor of wrestling that was on TNT was different than well, we Sergeant the Slaughter wrestling. True. We were in the True. attitude area for sure at that point, right? Yeah. I mean, okay, but actually, looking online, Sergeant Sergeant Slaughter was at its height in the uh, early to mid nineties. Okay, so, so that's right around. He would still be culturally that could be right. He would still be culturally relevant. Yeah. Okay. That is the Makes extent sense. of what I know about wrestling, by the way. <laughs> What the fuck are you people talking about? Oh, now, now I do want a B5 G.I. Joe crossover. We're getting a Transformer G.I. Joe crossover. We need a B5. Oh, Sergeant Joe. Slaughter. Yes. Yes. Nicole. I thought it was interesting when they had that meeting about the assassination uh, 
warning that he got, essentially, with all the players that were in the room, the usual suspects with Lockley. But I thought it was interesting that Lock Lockley, wait, Lockley? Lockley. 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 Like yeah. Robin of Locksley, but Lockley. Okay. Yes. Um, sure. she, um, she agreed with him, which kind of surprised me, which also pissed Garibaldi off, which made me chuckle a little bit. But it was interesting to see, like, the dynamic in there with the core players and then adding her to the mix, because... She's now the captain and then having her agree with him and then pissing off Delenn and everybody else because they want to protect him. And she was like, he's right. I'm interested to see more of that group dynamic as the show or as the season goes on. Kevin. So my my other thing, and not, not to disagree with Emily, I, res- I certainly respect your opinion, unlike other people on this podcast. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> I, I just I feel like they've gotten finally gotten Sheridan and Delenn right. I don't cringe when I hear their dialogue. I don't you know, I don't have a, a problem with how they're they're interacting. And I, I would like to hear if, you know, if anyone else feels similarly or or the same as Emily, because I just I, I feel like they they it took them a while. It was cringy at times, um, particularly early, but I feel like they're Very. finally getting it right. Jesse? No, no. is the answer. Ah, no. Ah. <laughs> I listen. She's always got the I just got fucked look every single time she's in his room. <laughs> and it's like, really, do we need, like, I don't need wow. to see that puppy dog, like, bullshit. She was biting her shirt, so. She, like, literally came the very first scene we see her come out. Oh, did she? This- You're welcome. Yes, Jesse, tell us more about how she came, please. <laughs> the very first scene. Just She just always looks like she just fucking got out of bed. And it's like, come on, bro. <laughs> There's got to be more to you two than just fucking sex scene. All right. Moving on. Jesus. I don't know if you can't tell, but I don't have it in me for another shitty season. So <laughs> I just really need to not. Gives <laughs> no more fucks. Dude. And listen, we haven't even I, got I, to the telepaths yet either. I know. I listen. I've dealt with this for two seasons. Three and four were pretty decent, and now here we are back to fucking season one again. And I'm just not here for it. Okay, <laughs> I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. Justin, I'm trying to recover here. <laughs> uh, give me a second. How do I follow that? I'll, I'll yeah, how do I Justin, follow but... that shit? She because... came in the first scene. Go ahead, Justin. Go. Oh my god. Oh. Because yeah, how do how do I follow up to De, uh, Delenn's WAP? Oh no, no. I'm not really sure at this point because honestly, I don't remember what I was gonna say. What was the you question? Just nose goes. That? What was that? WAB. Yes, nose goes. <laughs> what was the what was the what were we talking about before Jesse talked? Well, Kevin said that he feels that they're finally getting Sheridan and Dylan correct in their relationship, and Jesse feels otherwise. Good talk. Oh, good talk, okay, Justin. Carry on. Go to Blake. <laughs> Mike, Jesus. <laughs> Jesse, Ooh. Jesse wrecked me. I can't. I can't handle it. Mike or Blake? Which I, we've derailed no, again. Mike with his wet ass bone. <laughs> oh no, no! I wonder. No. So Not Justin, Jesse, so Justin, Jesse broke you much like Sheridan broke to Lynn. Oh, yeah, pretty much. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, wait, though. That just made me think of the uh, wait, <laughs> the comment where Sheridan said, uh, seeing Londo naked. <laughs> and then Londo I, just gives thought, him... I just thought about six six <laughs> lying around. <laughs> and Londo gives him the best look when he says that to yeah. you. Yeah. Are you doing honestly, honestly, like, okay, during that scene, I picture the song Sandstorm. Do 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 That deep cut brought to you by Justin. Let's do it. It's sad that this is an audio podcast because watching those two is pretty fucking funny. There's a lot of bouncing going on, folks. On both sides, a lot of dicks flying around, but it's fine. There are no actual dicks. Not yeah, not actual ones. Just hands motioning like them. Okay. All at a time. Start over. Can we? Just... Kevin's over. question is Let's... why is he still here? Because holy right. shit. <laughs> can we can we start over with season one, please? Just start right. over. Oh please, please. Blake, what do you got? I, fuck it. Just move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just thank everybody. You only have like twenty two episodes of this left. Come on. Oh, so how about we not... talk about Jakar? Sure. Okay. Why not? What do you have to say about Jakar, Kevin? You fuck this up. <laughs> well, given that I'm not a not a Jefferson fan, I think Jakar is a much better Jefferson than uh, 
than the real guy, but uh, I think he was the perfect choice. Oh, for... I just finally got that reference. I was like, Jeff, I like the Jefferson. <laughs> like no, that's the... what I was thinking. I was like, moving on up. <laughs> <Dude. laughs> <That's laughs> what I was thinking. Oh my god, that's where <laughs> my brain went to. I was like, the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> the hell's Kevin talking about? I, Thomas I actually... Jefferson. I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> he wrote the declaration. Okay, we got. Um, it. Yeah, Blake but... is just done. <laughs> Blake, for those who uh, you know are listening to this, Blake has got his hand on his. He's just doing a, a Picard face palm as low as he can go. His head is down. He is questioning life choices and wondering if he can get away with murder so. in five states. Individually, we are actually intelligent, but you put us together. <laughs> I don't know what that. It just devolves quickly. That is debatable. And so <laughs> yeah, it blinks like I met you all individually. Fuck you. <laughs> that Justin's a dumb ass. Mm-hmm. Anywho, um, I voted for Trump. Geniuses, <laughs> Mike. Mike, right. don't I have no idea how to get there. this it's back. Back, hate mail. This train back on the tracks. Okay, Jakar Jefferson, go. I knew tracks. And by the way, the end tag of this episode, I'm going to lose monetization for it, but it's okay. We'll be moving on up. I guess I should have said Thomas, but okay. <sighs> well, we, we should have understood, but we're fucking idiots. So go ahead. So anyway, Jakar. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, Mike. You're the Jakar, I, biggest yeah. Jakar fan. I, I thought, I, Jesus, now you want me to get this back on track. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. please. I, yes, I thought, I thought Jakar's role in this episode was, was really kind of sweet. Um, uh, from from the first scene where uh, you know Box Lightner goes to <laughs> Sheridan, goes to visit him and and you know puts upon him basically, hey everybody respects the shit out of you man, and you're you're the guy to write my speech. I thought that was really kind of lovely and showing you know his his character growth through uh, the series to date. And then again during the assassination attempt, you know, when the the would-be assassin misses his first shot and then circles back with his Star Fury literally 10 seconds later, uh, I thought it was really a nice touch that, you know, Sh- Delenn stayed with Sheridan and Chikar stayed with Sheridan. He made the choice to to hang out and, and you know, be a potential victim of, of that catastrophe while Londo was probably plowing his second bowl of spoo at the buffet. <laughs> Nicole. Yeah, I also just kind of want to echo what Mike was saying. I really thought that um, it was really sweet how Jakar reacted when Sheridan asked him to write it. He was so excited and like honored. And he's like, I'm not going to sleep. I'm not going to eat. I'm going to become one with this. And he was so excited. And it was so it was such a wholesome, like genuine moment. It really just made me so happy. And it was so nice to just see that like relationship develop between them and for him to ask him that. And it was such a like a very wholesome moment. You know, we don't get a lot of wholesome moments on television now, which I hate to say I sound old, but like just something so simple and wholesome and sweet. It just really made you feel good. That's not true, Nicole. I've watched many seasons of British Bake Off. Oh, I've never seen that show, so maybe <laughs> and, I'll watch and, it. And and uh making it with Amy Poehler and Nick Offerman. Highly okay. recommended. It's All like right. it's like sunshine and kittens distilled into 30 minutes of television. Oh, I'm more of a nailed it guy. I do yeah, that's good too. Nailed Different it. vibe. You had Different me a kittens, so I'm happy with oh. that. I just watched Bridgerton for the first time, and I'm and I'm obsessed. I just wanted to drop that. Here. We're not talking about WAP again, Justin. He's a <laughs> WAP, WAP, W A B. Oh Christ! Uh, I, you know, on on the Is that uh, better than FAP. I'm just wondering. Oh my! Definitely not. <laughs> Leave me. I, I did the. <laughs> I broke Justin again. Blake just went off camera. He, he's out. <laughs> I was I was a little disappointed that we didn't actually get to hear like a super epic Jakar speech, and instead he, they kind of phoned that that scene in with, I included one page of every religious text from every race, which I guess is like one from the Minbari, one from the Narn, one from the Centauri, and then like thousands from Earth. No, that book must. No, have no, been... the the Narn have a bunch. <laughs> you know I'm what saying. I. You, you make a good point. They actually, for the first time, as far as I remember, this whole series, they talked about that this episode, didn't mm-hmm. they? That there were they at least said, a couple different books. When you turn 10, you pick your you pick your religion for yourself. Mm-hmm. And as we know, Jakar is a follower of Jaquan. 
So is the so is the book the version of the Trump Bible? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> well, we'll have to see. No, it did not have a Venmo link. <laughs> <laughs> you can buy the sneakers too. Yay, mm-hmm. Nicole! No, you can't because they won't make them. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, uh, two things. One to wrap up the Jakar discussion. Please. Yes. <laughs> I also really enjoyed the story. Somebody just brought it up, the story about how he picked his true name when he was 10. Mm-hmm. And he said mm-hmm. to Sheridan, perhaps maybe Mr. President is your true name. That was really a cool anecdote story. Um, I enjoyed that um, Emily disagrees lot. with that. Oh. But I want to move over to the telepaths. I really want to talk about them. I've been waiting for them to be last because, well, let us begin. <laughs> okay. So at the beginning, when I gave my my intro, I said I was proved wrong, or I think I was. And the minute I saw that long haired Byron, I was like, that guy's shady, that guy's shady. And I, you know, me and the shady count. And I really had a bad feeling because it was like him and then murder dick. Where does Byron have the murder dick? What? I mean, maybe, Who the maybe fuck he does. Is murder that's, dick? that's that's the name I would have chosen for myself at age ten. <laughs> I have a follower oh of the book God. of murder dick. <laughs> Did I miss somebody who the no, fuck he's is like the assassin? The assassin. Oh, the, the assassin. Yeah. Okay. Because it, it flashed from Orlando. Byron to the <laughs> assassin. Orlando. But anyway, what what I was gonna say was so when he went into Lockley's head and said, Meet me in Brown, whatever, and she goes down there to meet him and brought her security with her, whatever. I wasn't really sure where this was going to go. I I wondered if he was like in on the plot or like the assassination plot or if he was bad. But then when he started talking about how they they're not violent and they, you know, like kind of they reminded me of like the Amish. I know that sounds probably inappropriate, but like they just were like very simple life, very they don't use technology. So when he said that, I was kind of thinking of that. I'm like, okay, maybe they're just like a I don't want to say Amish, but like a what are the like um. Puritan, I don't know. Mennonite. Do you, guys, do you guys know what I'm trying to say? Where they don't use technology, they don't use current things. They're just very they basic. Amish. They're more Mennonite. They're more Mennonite yeah. than Amish. Okay. The electric Amish. So yeah. yeah. So that's kind of what it reminded me of um, a little bit. So as they started talking and he started introducing us to everybody, and I was like, okay, well maybe they're not bad. And then that poor kid. What was his name? The, the special kid, one. the special Cullen. one, special bomb. I don't. Know. <laughs> I I kept calling him Samuel, and I know that's not his name. No, no. Leonardo he has DiCaprio's a name. Uh, Simon. 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 Okay. Special Simon. That's yeah. Special name. Simon. So, um, when he was showing her the flowers and all that, I'm like, okay, maybe they're not bad people. I mean, they're still telepaths, so they could be dangerous potentially. Anyway, as the plot goes on and and Simon basically finally speaks to save Sheridan, I kind of saw that coming. I bet I'm like, he's going to speak now. I bet you he's going to say something now. And then he showed everyone what he saw. So he really kind of like was the hero of the episode. And then when he died, I felt really bad because, you know, obviously I kind of saw that coming too. He's probably going to die. He's going to ma- save his last breath to speak. And so then at the end, when, um, she said no to them living there, but Sheridan kind of gave them the asylum. He made an interesting point at the end, and this was a really long way to get there, but he said a telepath war is going to come at some point, so it's better to have some of our own or on our side. So I thought that was kind of a good move on his part, I guess, to kind of like offer a place of refuge for them, because maybe if they form a relationship or a bond with them, they'd kind of be on their side when that happens, but... Again, we'll find out down the road. So um, I still don't feel 100% comfortable with them. I still feel like being telepaths is dangerous, but I feel like maybe they're not dickheads. So I don't know. I'm interested to see where this goes and what it develops into. Mike? (laughs) I I also don't feel 100% comfortable with them, and it might have something to do with the fact that Special Simon was just randomly crawling through the fence above somebody's room. (laughs) Well, he was escaped escaped from Franklin because he didn't want to get the treatments. No. no. Right? No? He was never even there. He was being sent home. Yeah, I think that was later. (laughs) Wait, no, he was going to give him IVs and stuff. No, no, that was immediately. before. So he was at Med Lab. He got And then he was in the rafters. Well, okay, but they all left. (laughs) Because he said he was going to prescribe them medicine. So he has to go to Walgreens to get the medicine down below. Yeah. And instead so they, he decided to go for a rent crawl, as there? one does. What? Yeah, and, and then I wondered... In. Yeah, I wondered they, if they were even physically there. Because, you know, again, why would telepaths be dangerous when they can project their visions onto anybody at any time? Not dangerous at all. It's great. It's fine. 
You know what? They were born that way. You guys are being a little judgmental. I know. I'm, and not, be, I'm not being woke. I apologize. Maybe let them be who they are. Okay. <laughs> Until they rape your mind, then you know. You question it. <laughs> listen, just give them a chance. They're just gonna send you flowers, Scott. Okay. Wait a minute, Jesse. Did did you just say give someone a chance after your little <laughs> rant about the new captain? <laughs> Seriously, your hypocrisy. I have name. It is just. I didn't say I didn't like her. I said, God damn it, oh. she's got a lot quicker time to get her shit together, so I can like her. All we are saying is oh. give Lockley a chance. <laughs> I kind of pick up a little bit of what Nicole's saying about not 100% trusting the telepaths because I don't think they're shady. I just think that when you're in a refugee state for so long and you would just expect everyone to reject you, the fact that somebody may actually give you a chance and be like, you know what, you can crash here for a little bit, might actually throw them off. And they're so skittish from having to run from Psycor for so long. Naturally, they're not going to trust anybody. So I kind of want to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. But I also see what you all are talking about. I'm not 100% certain if they're not the telepaths that start the telepath war. Because there was an ep in one of the previous episodes where they talked about how Sheridan and the Alliance made some mistakes that led to the telepath war. We don't know if this isn't one of the mistakes by, by allowing them to stay on Babylon 5. So one way or another, they could actually be the ones that ignite the war and make it as devastating as it is. But I still kind of feel like I, I, I want to love them like a little stray puppy, <laughs> but I'm not 100% sure if that's the right call, if they're not going to come and bite me in the backside at the end. Well, the only one that looked like a stray puppy got put down in this episode, so... Take that as you want. Oh, that's I terrible. Mean, they all, oh, the, <laughs> hey, just they like all the, kind of look uh, like stray puppies. Just hey, like Governor Christy Nome, they had to put down the puppy. Oh, and top I, that was <laughs> fucked up. And hey, JMS always said he wasn't going to have cute kids and robots in his show. We just saw what happened to the cute kids. <laughs> and yeah. the teddy bear got airlocked. Yeah. yeah and Bill Skarsgård's yeah. career went on just fine. <laughs> So a couple of he, did. he looked like young Bill Scarlett. He looked like Leonardo DiCaprio and it was 90s, so that was referenced. I mean, like, hey, we gotta have a Titanic kid too. Two things that come from me on the uh, telebat thing, and uh Justin, you hit on it a little bit, and I know I'm about to throw a grenade into our comment section, but have at it, kids. Uh this is very topical to me with Gaza and the idea that you have a group of people who no one wants. And what happens when you have a group of people that no one wants to have to find a place to live? And I'm just going to leave it there for that one. Enjoy comment section. Or the Armenians. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I but, mean, take uh, your take your pick on all the genocides that occurred. I was over just the trying 20, to be topical, Justin. Yeah, it's trying to be topical. Um, find yourselves on the wrong side of history, hating on these telepaths. So know, just I wait know. for it. I am. I'm that guy. Um, but White Sox fans. Oh, I saw the <laughs> shots fired. Damn I, straight, Mike. Damn straight. I was in Minnesota this week. I saw two White Sox <laughs> Twins games, and they sucked at both of them. Just, <laughs> the you, Twins, in that case. Yeah, well, the Sox are now four and twenty-two. They're, I saw a reel the other day about they're the like worst team in the league, and it well, had all are. these errors and all this. Well, crazy they just stuff. they just swept the Rays too. So, well, yeah, it's a race. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, moving right along. Uh, the other thing I, I liked about this whole scenario, we brought up a couple times already, is, you know, uh, it was brought up in, initially by, I think, Jesse. Lockley calls out that I want to handle all station decisions. And then Sheridan's like, fine, I'll take all the political. And then Lockley says no to the telepaths. And immediately Sharon's like, well, now this is a political idea, so I'm going to veto her. I love that we're already starting to get that little dynamic in there that, you know, nothing's ever binary. So let's see how many times these folks have to bounce each other off each other because you have two bosses and that is that never works. If you ever work for two bosses, it never works. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. I want to I want to get your impressions on the uh, the new intro because every epi every season gets a new one. Blake said this is his favorite. So what do you all think about it? I really liked it. I thought it was really cool. Can I just say how not memorable the B5 theme is? Mm. Because I listen to this one. I, I watch it every season. and, and the, the, Actually, I watch the intros every episode. But I listen to this one and I was like, I know this is the same theme. It's re-recorded. It's different. But I, I, 
like did not recognize it. See, my, it didn't is, sound the same to me at all. This is the one I like the most, and we've I, I don't I don't know when we talked about this. We talked about it before, but I like season five the most because it's got that like that march. It is much more, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, I don't want to say militaristic, but it's just it's got a better up tempo beat. To mm. it. It, it felt came, like Star Trek to me. It was kind of weird. I can't stand it. Really? No. Which I like season four, season three a lot better. This is actually the music that we've been using on our podcast since like episode three. Just throwing it out there. (laughs) No, I get it. I get it. And that's why I skip ahead from all the fucking bullshit intro stuff that you do. Oh, thanks. But, you know. (laughs) That actually takes some time, fucker. Jesus. (laughs) No. (laughs) And on the next episode of How Someone Got Fired from the Podcast. What will happen is the next episode will have an intro saying, fuck Justin, because I know he doesn't listen to it anyway. (laughs) (laughs) No, no. So anyway, it's... buy our shit on Redbubble, please. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> I think we still Justin's have going to have to find a new place to live after this. <laughs> and maybe I'll warm up to it as the season goes on. But just hearing it for the first time, mm. I wasn't a fan. Maybe it's like the new Taylor Swift album. You have to listen oh, to it no, a few times before you shit. like it. I'm sorry. But that, that new album is dog shit. I haven't listened to it. I don't know. I'm not a Swifty. I'm, I'm just going off of what I, I heard. I could, I could you have to listen to it for apparently four hours wow. in order to like it. But <laughs> anyway. I heard somebody describe it as the Dark Souls of Taylor Swift albums. <laughs> 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 you just have to survive it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway. They're literally okay. punishing. <laughs> All the Swifties can email us at gray 17 They're not listening. Don't com, worry. But, yeah. so, um, I, I know. I know our female demographics. They're not listening. <laughs> the problem is, all you have to do is say their name. <laughs> oh, then they come around. Our and algorithm like, just got them. fucked. Yep. Hey, yeah. Hey, oh, it's more viewership for at least one episode. Uh. Bring it. <laughs> we said her name too many times, and now it's like Beetlejuice. And I want to hashtag that shit now. Hashtag Swifties. Bring it. <laughs> and when the Swifties, yeah, it's... our name is Babylon for the first time. Yes. Have fun, kids. I just want to say I I like the new Taylor Swift album and I don't mind. You like Twilight. (laughs) Yeah, Twilight's good. Suck it. (laughs) Or as as Jerry Doyle would say. No, I think I think the filters are completely gone tonight. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, it's not my favorite. Yeah, we're talking about. We'll see how I feel about it. (laughs) Well try yeah, the intro. Not not Taylor Swift because I've not listened to any of her albums, but I really enjoyed season four okay. just because of how dark it was. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I liked it because you all know I have a dark soul yeah. personality. And my, like and my feelings are like it's black as my soul. And that's why I listen to my chemical romance. <laughs> but Very anyway. Love you. You just need the um, on there. We actually have a yeah. fan of ours in our Patreon uh, Discord. Uh, he's uh, he and he actually does like the Babylon Five intros with different theme music. So like he did Dallas for season four. It's <laughs> quite good. Oh <laughs> seriously, I'll have to go check that out. I didn't yeah, know it's, that. Uh, he puts it on. It's in our Discord, but he also puts us on his YouTube. I will. Yeah. I'll have to go dig up a link for it. But yeah, he, he yeah he's good. He's good for me. I uh, I've already said I I think this is the best music. Sorry, Justin. But I also like that. Again, remember this is a show that is being dropped on a brand new network. Their intention is to get new viewers and it's a little choppy, but you get the entire story in the intro. And it, I, I like that. I like that. It, it starts with Sinclair with a hole in his mind and we get all the way to taking out Clark. I, it's, it's, it's a real fun March, which is why I enjoy it a lot. And JMS gave Babylon five a tramp stamp. So we have that too. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> and then we, it's then almost we... like the, it's almost like the, um, what is it on the uh, Family Guy Star Wars episode where they put the Bush Cheney sticker on the back of the Star Destroyer? Which is still a copy off of Spaceballs, but right. Well, yeah, it's still Spaceballs, but <laughs> well, Scott likes marches, but not the Imperial March. So, oh, oh well, that's, that's dark. See, I, I'm a hopeful um, guy. Okay, I'm hopeful. Justin I... likes Justin likes to kill puppies. I like to raise them. <laughs> oh my no, God. I'm a cat guy, so I don't give a shit about puppies. This season's theme music does is reminiscent of the uh, the redone Enterprise uh, music. I, I agree with Justin. I'm not a humongous fan of it. Did you just re- reference Faith of the Heart? <laughs> what, yeah, what do you yes, have I did. Yeah, because it's not 
It's it's a dumbass Star Trek theme. I'm sorry. The closest like I've it. ever had to a religion that I've practiced is worshiping underneath a Rod Stewart poster in my friend's basement. <laughs> we, yes. Oh, Hi, Lord. Sean. How are you? <laughs> in Rod, what we the trust. Fuck? So I prayed to Rod, and it gave me the strength to punish my enemies in time splitters. That's all I know. So. No. <laughs> Can we can yeah, we let's this over? Okay. That being <laughs> said, <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's go ahead and wrap this sucker up with our questions and predictions from our newbies. Again, they have not watched past No Compromises, so I'm interested to see if you have any lingering questions about what you've seen so far, and also what your predictions are next, which is kind of important because these are going to be the predictions that are going to round out season five. So, what do you think is going to happen? I already have Justin's question: of Does Lockley and Sheridan have a past? So, what okay. else we got? Let's go to Nicole. Questions and predictions. Um. So, is the telepaths being on Babylon Five going to cause a conflict? Uh, one in general, and two between Sheridan and Lockley, because she said no, he said yes, and then is this going to be? an ongoing thing with like people trying to kill Sheridan or is this and then prediction wise I don't know I I really don't know what to expect but I do know that I'm excited to see more of like that core group and how that works out and I'm interested to see the dynamic that the telepaths are going to bring to the station and how that develops I guess I predict that I feel like Garibaldi and Lockley are going to have some some words throughout the season based upon what we've talked about so that's all I got. Is that your way of saying they're going to smash? I'm honestly no. surprised she didn't say that. She no, they're going to they're going to they're going to butt heads. They're going to butt heads. That's what I meant. I don't he's got lease. He doesn't need to smash her. Although Different Franklin area codes. was Different area Franklin codes. was kind of looking a little like, "Hey, hi, who are you?" I mean, you know, Franklin's got to get his too. It's cool. Season he's one, he, Franklin. Here we go. Nope. Number one is on uh, Mars, so his his side piece is gone again. Right. Different oh, area code. Even. Also, his husband Steven. just died. So wait, who? Marcus and him were married. Oh, oh that's Christ. right. That's right. Oh, sad. Died. Thanks for reminding us, Dick. You're welcome. <laughs> We are missing two lead characters this season. Sad, sad day. Okay, let's go to Emily. Questions, predictions. Question, do we get to see Lockley in a nightgown? We've seen Jakar in the robe. We've had Vanova in the nightgown. Like, I don't know. I feel like we need to keep this going. I, I recommend you stick around for season five. Woohoo! <laughs> so thirst. So All thirst right, track so there Lockley might be coming. like one redeeming quality in season five. Got There's it. There's also a movie you may be interested. We'll get to that when we get to it. <laughs> Okay, now I'm concerned that's not actually B5 related at all. <laughs> brown yeah. chicken, brown cow. <laughs> I really you're don't gonna, have You're going to love yet. River of Souls. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> More like turd space. Am I right, guys? <laughs> we were. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have a lot yet because I'm still not sure what to think, but I'm not sure about these. Um, I think these telepaths are going to bring some shit to B5, whether or not it's Psychor coming after them or whether or not they start themselves. I'm concerned this uh, group of telepaths is is a problem. So there's my one prediction. And we obviously know a telepath war is like going to happen. That got spoiled somewhere along the line. Well, it wasn't spoiled. It was called out by Delenn in the last episode. She oh, said, yeah. yeah. For some reason, it feels like a spoiler. Well, and, uh, I mean, even Bester's been talking about it for forever. There's a war coming. I mean, it's been yeah. it's been Well, but then they talked time. about it in the fast forward episode, too. They talk about how the there was a, what, a Dilgar war and a, yeah. and a, um, and a, the telepath war and stuff I think, like I think that. I she so. said telepath incident, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, but. But but yeah, we all know this this shit's coming. Yeah, it, I don't know. I think it feels spoilery because we're not supposed to know what happens. <laughs> like we haven't been able to Google, so it feels like knowing something that's coming feels kind of weird. I'm still not decided if they bring the problem, mm -hmm. like they start it, or if Psychor starts it by coming after them. Okay, uh, Jesse, questions, predictions. I have no questions. Uh, my predictions are I'm still waiting for Jakar to kill Londo. And um, my prediction is that I'm fucking done with this whole entire series by the end of this season. I thoroughly enjoyed season three and four. And I'm having a little like a little a little grief over Ivanova being gone. Like it's her. It hurts. It's a very sensitive subject right now. So I predict that I'm just going to continue to want to 
dig my eyeball out with a spoon every single time I watch an episode. But, you know, maybe I, I've been wrong before. So. Now I need to go watch Robin Hood. <laughs> dig your eyeball out with a spoon. <laughs> Why a spoon? Because it's dollar, you twist it or hurt more. <laughs> it God, I hurt fucking more. love that movie so much. Oh, yeah. You're right. welcome. Oh, what? Robin Hood, Prince of Fees. Kevin Costner. Mm-hmm. The I'll best be Robin Hood movie it. ever. Even except, without, even without the him Disney doing a one. decent English accent. <laughs> that, was me. He oh my, that was an incredible movie. Unlike <laughs> other Robin Hoods, to, I can speak with an we English had to accent. Watch, we had to watch that movie at Mike's house because he did a report on it. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to hear it because I watched that movie literally about 50 times one summer. <laughs> And Men in Tights is more historically accurate. Well, but anyway. Men in Tights. <laughs> okay. Jesse, I've not watched it since. It's been. <laughs> I, Jesse, are you uh, are you good? I'm done. <laughs> in many you ways. You know it's true. I'm in so many Everything ways. I do. I do it for you. Wow. Wow. Gotta do it for Tracy Scoggins. Blake Grace 17 karaoke that, uh, coming soon. I toboggan for you. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, Justin, questions, predictions. Do I even want to fucking talk at this point? No. I don't. <laughs> Probably Jesse not. Want you. No. 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 Jesse doesn't. Jesse hates the sound of my voice, but that's fine. <laughs> um. So you had my first not question. True. Um, second question, do we ever find out what side Lockley was, or does it even really matter at this point? Question three, do we ever get to read what was the actual oath and what are the principles? Do we ever find out? I'm kind of one as being a, like a student of, you know, governmental documents. I, 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 I kind of want to know what the founding precepts are of this interstellar alliance. So prediction one I think Lockley and Sheridan will actually be butting the heads over who has control over what different parts of the station. And I think this just comes from my experience with, with Battlestar Galactica, watching those two characters butt heads over and over about who has control over what situation. So I just kind of see the same thing happening here. Um, prediction number two. I honestly think the telepaths on Babylon 5 do end up starting, whether directly or indirectly, I think they will end up starting whatever telepath war ends up coming to fruition. Um, and then prediction three. I ha I just have a feeling that it's going to be really a lot of trouble for Sheridan and Delenn because even though everybody's now part of this interstellar alliance and we're supposed to be all one happy family, there's still going to be a lot of non-aligned world grudges that are still going to come up. And people are still going to be bitching and trying to fight each other over stupid shit. So I think it's just going to make lot people's lives a lot difficult on Babylon 5 trying to actually get this alliance to come together and actually act like a union instead of just pretending to be a union. But anyway, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> Thanks, Simple Simon. We appreciate it. Mm. Okay. With that, we'll go ahead and wrap up our conversation with the newbies next week and i'm going to throw this title out and i think a couple people are just going to give me interesting looks when i say it the next episode is the very long night of londo malari so we will be discussing that episode oh, nicole got a look so we'll be discussing that episode next week be sure to like subscribe follow leave us a review also we are running the, the contest right now to where i have two very old cd rom boxes uh, of uh both the b5 uh, encyclopedia and a B5 arcade game that may or may not work on your computer. But if you leave us a review uh, as, on Apple or and subscribe to us on YouTube, you can be entered into the running for that competition. And as always, be sure to check out our social media links. We're active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you can, join us over on our Discord by joining our Patreon. And a big thank you to our great council members, those listed as producers down below, who support us the most on Patreon every single month. It is wonderful. We appreciate it so much. Until next week, I am Scott, and with me has been... Mike. Nicole. Mike. Justin. Emily. Just, uh, Justin. Ah! Just, Jesse, not Justin. <laughs> And Kevin. What the? For those who don't care about spoilers, stick with us after the credits and we'll go beyond the rim and talk about all these questions and predictions. And by the way, I'm very proud of you guys. We have more questions and predictions than we've had in about four or five episodes. Good job. Woo. Good job.
Okay, goodbye. Fuck you guys. I don't have the brain capacity to go through another season one. And you fuckers are leading us right into it. And you didn't even fucking give us a heads up. Like, you you guys are like, all this shit we've talked about season five. Oh, they, they, no, they've said, they've said multiple times season five is shit. Jesse, uh, Jesse, I'll tell you right now, because I want you to stick with us. Season five starts very, very shittily. But I would argue the second half of season season five is extremely good, and uh, I, I'm not gonna say why. But I'm, I was just actually looking at the rankings, and there's about a run of five or six episodes there. It's like nine point five, nine point three on Rutgers Guide, nine point two, and I don't. Yeah, I see it. You gotta get through the big pile of shit to get there. Well, I don't but, listen. Do I have a choice? No, I don't. Well, I, I mean, really, you always have a choice. No, but. no choice here. Like I, I'm, I'm, you guys are holding me hostage, and I. <laughs> Mike, Mike actually has the gun to your head off camera. Yes, <laughs> I'm not here on my own free will. So let's just start there. I'm but, definitely okay. putting that in the show. No, nope, not tonight, <laughs> Satan. Thank you for listening to Gray Seventeen, a Babylon Five podcast. You can find all the places to listen to and watch this podcast at anchor.fm slash gray17podcast or youtube.com at gray17podcast. We want to hear from you, so join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or Patreon. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review where you are listening to or watching this podcast. Gray17 is not affiliated with, and the podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. Welcome back to Beyond the Rim. Again, this is a spoiler section. If you've not watched No Compromises or just don't remember what happens after that, then we uh, ask you to leave now. And if not, we'll go ahead and dive in to our newbies' questions and predictions. And guys, the first question is, do Lockley and Sheridan have a past? It seems they know each other. Oh, just a little, in the biblical sense, anyway. Dylan is not the first person he's boned. (laughs) <laughs> they were of course uh, married which is an interesting thing that i can't wait to to hear the the newbies reactions to uh, because be i so don't pissed. Think, yeah i don't think they're gonna like it and i think it's gonna be a lot of fun well i like how nicole was trying to argue against the point like oh no i don't think so i think he just respected her as a military professional <laughs> no nicole the one time you're not shipping anybody they shipped <laughs> But yeah, no, I, 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 one of the things I like about season five, at least I remember liking about season five, is this dynamic. And actually, I just today uh, had to watch Objects at Rest, the second to last episode of the season, series, because I was over on our friends over the Who Are You podcast and w- talked about that episode with them. And they have a very good scene at the end of the episode, or in the beginning of the episode, where they're talking about the past year that they've had. And uh, I love the dynamic that Sheridan and Lockley have by the end of it. So I'm looking forward to this conflict and I'm looking forward to seeing how this all works out for the newbies. Cause I agree. I think they're going to have fun with that revelation one way or the other. Well, and there's so much there with Garibaldi too. I mean, the two of them lock horns, like most of the season, even, even including the stuff that goes with Garibaldi's drinking problem, but not certainly that's, you know, not, uh, not the only part of it uh, by any means. Mm-hmm. I don't, I've never been clear on why she's so hostile towards him. Perhaps they get to that later on. I don't recall that, but uh, I think it's just because she's a by the book kind of girl and he's not. Yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 I my impression, and you're right. I mean, I may have miss forgot something and we'll talk about it when we get to there, but I just feel like she is very much somebody who doesn't like variables. She doesn't like somebody who's going to cause trouble. And that's all Garibaldi does is cause trouble. Well, then you would wonder why she'd be willing to work with Sheridan giving his very recent history. <laughs> well, I mean, on that one, she doesn't have a choice. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> he's he's not going anywhere. Although now Garibaldi's not going anywhere either. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Speaking of Lockley, do we ever find out what side she was on? Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it gets called out. And the answer is 
she was on the not the side of the resistance. I wouldn't say she was a Clark supporter, but she definitely was not on the side of the resistance. Yeah, her her whole viewpoint was I didn't have the right to disobey mm-hmm. orders. Which we had a long conversation with our team about that when we talked about it a few episodes ago. So we'll I'm sure we'll bring that up again uh, and chat about that some more. Is this going to be a thing that goes on a lot where everyone tries to kill Sheridan? Uh, I think Emily would like them to kill Sheridan, but I don't think it's going to happen too much more. Yeah, it's not like Assassin of the Week. No, there's a couple more times in there, I think, thrown in. But a lot of it is he's the president, so he's always going to have a gun on him. But it's not like the major plot points. Like even when the telepaths start revolting, they're not going after Sheridan. They're going after everybody. So do we learn about the principles that Jakar is writing? There's actually a full episode about it, like three episodes from now. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it's not really like the Fringy rules of acquisition. They don't quote them every five seconds. But we are definitely getting, and uh, the newbies haven't brought this up too much yet. We are definitely getting a bird's eye view of the creation of the Book of Jakar. And even here it gets called out. Even though the book's not finished yet, his people are starting to quote from it. So we are definitely getting the idea that he is going to be, for lack of a better term, a holy leader. Uh, and this is his book is going to be a big part of that as he works to finish it. I do love the fact that Garibaldi put coffee stains on it, though. Again, <laughs> that's just Garibaldi. Dick. Does the telepaths being on B5 cause the conflict? Cause no, the no, no, no. They're, they're, they're well-behaved. It never <laughs> causes a problem. Psychor never shows up and wants their heads on a, heads on pikes. Yeah. No, no, no. It's not well, a big deal. But I, I think uh, that goes into our first two predictions, which is the telepaths are either going to cause Psychor to come and start shit or that they will do it themselves without Psychor's help. And then the same idea, do the telepaths on B5 start the telepath war? And to that, the answer is, yeah, kind of on both. Uh, we will see Bester and Byron interact. We will see that they continue to cause trouble on B5. And at the end of it, Byron will be killed and cause more issues with Lita. But what frustrates me, and I don't know if you guys agree or not, but one of the things that frustrates me is we never actually get an answer to this question. We know if you read the books, yes, I know Lita continues to be on a quest for revenge and the war starts a few years later when the telepaths try to take over earth Alliance, blah, 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 blah. But in the show, we see this and we get told that this is a start of something, but we never actually get to see it. Yeah. It is disappointing that they never really get to that. It it feels like that would have been a little bit more satisfying to deal with that in the fifth season. Um, I I don't have a clear um, memory because I never did finish my re- rewatches uh, season five, and now I'm not going to purposely. So I don't I don't recall what totally you know is it, you know season five entails, but I remember the Garibaldi stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, and in, in, in the the gist of it the gist of it is that the telepaths want to continue to grow this colony want to have their independence, but in the process, they do just become a thorn in everyone's side. Psychor absolutely does utilize them as a pawn. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, it ends with the colony being broken up and Byron being killed and right. Lita, his whatever you want to call her when she gets involved with it, into somebody who will continue to stir the pot after he's gone until she goes off on her little uh, her little jaunt with Jakar for a couple of years. But at the end of the day, the telepath war kind of ends when Lita and Lanier blow up Psychor and kill themselves in the process. But again, that's in a book, it's not in the show. I wonder if part of it was JMS was holding this back for, obviously he wanted to have Crusade going, he wanted to have potentially other franchise stuff. So the telepath war was something rather big that he could keep in his back pocket. But still, unfortunately, we never actually got an answer that is, you know, canon. But the next one, uh, Garibaldi and Lockley are going to continue to butt heads. Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, again, it's Garibaldi. I'm interested to see how Nicole specifically feels about Garibaldi halfway through this season, well, not even halfway, like three quarters through, the, or one quarter through the season, when he does take his turn and goes down to the bottle again. I uh, I think uh, everyone is assuming that we get a pretty easy and quick transition from Garibaldi is the bad guy to, oh, everything's cool now, but we're still going to get that, that turn again. And I wonder if the newbies will be in for that or if they'll just be tired of Garibaldi being the butt of everything. We'll see. 
And on the same note, Lockley and Sheridan are going to butt heads. Yes. There is going to be some more strife between the two of them with, with exactly what Justin alluded to when you've got somebody in charge of military matters and somebody in charge of political matters. Um, there's no clear defined, uh, you know, uh, difference between the two all the time. And yeah, that's going to cause conflict. And that's one of the things that JMS built into this season is that, you know, he built in conflict with garibaldi he built built in conflict with lockley and sheridan and the telepaths i mean that's that's what a good writer does yeah. is you know he doesn't always show you exactly where he's going to go with it but he's going to build that in so that it, it's interesting mm -hmm. lockley is a very interesting character i actually and i know this is sacrilege but there are times where i like lockley more than ivanova but for that very point is she actually stirs the pot more once Ivanova gets to a certain place, we, we we know who Ivanova is. With Lockley, she's a variable that just keeps things going. And I also like her spunk. I think she's a fun captain. She's mm -hmm. unlike Sinclair, who was never really meant to be a captain, was just kind of there. And Sheridan, who, again, was aloof and Sheridan, she doesn't take two shits. She's like, okay, this is what it is. I'm the captain. Fuck off. Anything else you guys want to talk about about this episode? Cool. Great. Good talk. <laughs> We'll be back next week to talk about the very long night of Londo Malari. Uh, that's going to be a fun one. We get to see Londo's uh, appendages again. So that's always great. <laughs> uh, until next week, I've been Scott. With me has been Blake, Mike, and Kevin. See you, everybody. Be sure to like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Thanks. We moving on up. <laughs> <Inside>. <laughs>